Hello, so now we go into the second topic or the earth system and in this topic there are three subtopics the first being the components of the earth system in which I'll talk about selected components of the earth system which is the ocean or the hydrosphere, the terrestrial biosphere and also the different roles of the components of the earth system in climate. The second subtopic is the carbon cycle which I'll discuss about the amount of carbon in the atmosphere or the carbon cycle in the atmosphere the carbon in the biosphere and also the carbon in the oceans and the last topic is on the hydrologic cycle or the cycle of water in the earth system. First we look at the different components of the earth system. The earth system is made up of many components, the first being atmosphere and the atmosphere is made up of collection of gases and the, the processes of radiation and convection in the atmosphere regulate the temperature in the atmosphere among other processes. There's also the hydrosphere which is made up of liquid water and water has a very high thermal inertia or high heat capacity which means that it can hold heat at a high amount. It also has a very big role in the carbon cycle or it can store relatively high amounts of carbon in it. Then there's the cryosphere or the solid water or ice and because of its color which is white it reflects uh, incoming solar radiation outward which also helps in reducing temperature in the atmosphere or on the earth. The fourth sphere is the biosphere or the sphere that's made up of living things and living things would release oxygen and also absorb carbon dioxide through biogenic processes. And the last sphere is the geosphere which is made up of sediments, rocks and magma um, and this too holds carbon but on a very long time scales in the order of thousands to millions of years. The climate is linked to all the processes that occur in these components. First we start with the hydrosphere component or the oceans. As you know the ocean covers a large portion of the earth which is approximately at 72 percent. Characteristic of the Water in the ocean is the density because water contains dissolved salts and the density of water is linearly dependent on the amount of salt that is dissolved in it. So the range of salt that is dissolved in water is from 34 to 36 grams of salt for every kilogram of fresh water. And because of the salt in seawater, the water in the sea is denser than fresh water. And the density of seawater depends on temperature, salinity and pressure but the relationship of these three or four variables is complicated. For instance, fresh water. The density increases with temperature between the narrow temperature range of 0 degrees and 4 degrees Celsius, which means that ice or water that freezes on fresh water would float. But for seawater, the density decreases with temperature in the same temperature range. But because of the fact that water rejects salt as it freezes, it becomes less dense and it also floats. Now we look at the complicated relationship between density, temperature, and salinity. This is a figure that shows the effect of salinity on density of seawater but at different latitudes of the earth. If we want to raise the density of seawater by an arbitrary amount of 1 grams of per kilogram salinity, then in the polars we see that the temperature changes are large to increase density somewhere on the left at low temperatures. But in the tropics where it's warmer, the changes are small to increase density. Plus, it means that in the polar region, there will be rapid changes of density or temperature due to salinity changes. While in the tropics, the changes of temperature and density would be slower because of the warmer water temperature. Some terms and definitions used for the ocean include the pycnocline, the thermocline, the halocline, and water masses, among other terms. Now, the pycnocline is defined by a water density profile while the thermocline is the water temperature density profile and the halocline is the water salinity profile and the schematic of that profile can be seen in the figure in the right. So the water that is closest to the atmosphere is called the mixed layer and this layer ha comes into direct contact with the atmosphere and wind. And this layer has a density slightly lower than the density of the majority of the depth of the ocean which is about a few tenths of a percentage of the density of the waters beneath it and below this mixed layer the water density and the temperature declines rapidly and this reduction in temperature and also density is within the cline layer or the pycnocline or thermocline layer and this layer goes from 10 meters to 100 meters in depth. Somewhere below this layer is the deep water layer where the pycnocline and thermocline remains relatively constant. This is a, the thermocline for different parts of the earth at different latitudes to show the difference between the profile of these different latitudes. So somewhere in the tropics, the thermocline is steeper which means that the temperature varies with height 
at a faster rate in the tropics compared to the northern or southern latitudes. Um, but even the seasons would change the, the profile of temperature. But as it goes deeper, uh, by about 500 meters below the surface of the water, the temperature profile merges to become the same profile. And as it goes even deeper, it is at a cold temperature of about 1 to 2 degrees Celsius, and it stays relatively the same temperature to the bottom of the ocean. Now we look at water masses. There are three main water masses. One is the Mediterranean outflow. And the Mediterranean outflow originates somewhere from Mediterranean area. And this water mass is warm and salty because of uh, high evaporation and less precipitation. Now the North Atlantic deep water or the NADW originates from somewhere to the coast of Greenland and this comes from the sinking of water along the ice edge of Greenland. Somewhere deep in the ocean, such as in the deep water layer, there is low mixing between the mixed layer, the climb layer, and the deep layer water layer because of this profile. So if a water mass is within the deep water layer, uh, the temperature and the salinity would be constant um, as it travels throughout the world. So for the NADW, as it comes from the Greenland area of the coast of Greenland, as it flows in the bottom layers of the ocean, it maintains its temperature and also its salinity. And these water masses are separate from each other at, at different layers, which again maintains its temperature and salinity level. There are two main components that drives the ocean circulation throughout the world. The first being the wind-driven component and the other is the thermal haline component. Now the wind-driven component is for the topmost surface layer or mixed layer of the ocean, which ranges from a few tens of meters to hundreds of meters to the depth of the ocean. And the wind-driven component would transfer momentum from the wind into the ocean. Uh, because of this rapid transfer, the component occurs at a short time scale of a few days to a few hours or even to a few weeks at the most. Now for the we can see the similarity between the ocean circulation and world circulation because of this fact. Uh, on the left we see the ocean circulation where there is a, a circular pattern in the ocean that also mimics the circular pattern of the wind which implies that the wind drives the circulation pattern of the ocean because of the transfer of momentum. Then we look at the thermal hairline component which is for the deep layers of the ocean and because of the pycnocline and thermocline profile, so the density and temperature profile, it inhibits the vertical mixing of um, the ocean in the deep layers, which also creates water masses at different layers of the ocean. Now because of the slow mixing, the time scale of the thermohaline circulation is very long, which ranges for a few hundreds of years. Now this is a schematic of the thermohaline circulation from the equator to the pole, um, the equator where it's warm, the water um, is warmer as it moves northwards, it becomes cooler, and as you reach the poles, the north pole, uh, salt is rejected as water freezes, which increases the density of water in the pole, and uh, this uh, would sink downwards to the bottom layer, and this water will move back to the south, where it becomes warmer and less dense, and it rises up and this uh, circulation pattern is what we call the thermal haline circulation. Now this can be seen in the previous figure where it shows the areas of where the water sinks uh, such as in the North Pole off the coast of Greenland uh, denoted by the shaded region where there is a downwelling of water masses and this water mass would move throughout the globe and uh, would return back as the return flow denoted by the red line. Now at the South Pole, there's also some downwelling that shown here, where again it will flow throughout the globe. Uh, looking at the red line as it comes to the North Pole, uh, this is the water that sinks because of cooling uh, effect, because of the freezing of water, uh, which now translates into the blue color line that goes throughout. So this circulatory pattern is the simplified depiction of the thermal hairline circulation throughout the world. Now we look at marine life in the hydrosphere or the marine biosphere. The mixed layer or the surface layer can absorb sunlight and this occurs within the few hundreds of meters of the surface of the ocean. And this layer that absorbs sunlight is what we call the euphotic zone. And in this zone there is life. 
because instead of sunlight, there's also nutrients such as carbon, phosphorus, and iron. One example of a marine organism in this layer is the phytoplankton. And this phytoplankton uses the carbon and the nutrients to undergo the photosynthesis process so that it can produce food for itself, which would create more oxygen in the layer in the euphotic zone and lower nutrients and dissolved carbon because the nutrients and the dissolved carbons are the raw materials of the photosynthesis process. Now this process is fast, it occurs within a time scale of a few days, which means that nutrients would, be need to, would need to be continually supplied to the surface layer to sustain this process. So how does the nutrients or carbon get uh, supplied to the euphotic zone? The carbon or nutrients will be transferred to the euphotic zone through the process of upwelling or the movement of water masses from the bottom layers of the ocean to the surface. And the upwelling process is controlled by surface winds. Now how does the carbon that gets transferred um, to the surface and also carbon that is stored in the phytoplankton um, gets moved back into the deeper layers of the ocean? Uh, it goes back to the deeper layers of the ocean by the uh, decomposition of the marine organisms uh, which effectively transfers the carbon in the organisms to the deeper layers. Here we see the schematic of the carbon and oxygen profiles within the euphotic zone. The carbon profile shows that at the bottom of the ocean or in the deeper layers of the ocean, the amount of carbon dissolved is high, but as it goes up to the surface, it becomes less because of photosynthesis process where the phytoplankton uses up the carbon or nutrients to produce oxygen which causes the amount of oxygen in the surface layer or the euphotic zone to be higher than the level in the deeper ocean. This is an example of a phytoplankton, which is mainly green because of chlorophyll. Here we see a satellite image of an area that shows signs of a phytoplankton bloom. It can be clearly seen because of the bright green color shown here. Now we see more phytoplankton and green in the coastal region because of upwelling process. Upwelling and phytoplankton indirectly related because where there's upwelling, there's um, higher amounts of nutrients and carbon and which attracts phytoplankton and also lets phytoplankton thrive. So we can see more greenery or phytoplankton in the coast compared to the deeper oceans. And we can also imply upwelling regions uh, based on the amount of phytoplankton there are um, in the area. So for example, in the middle of the ocean where there's less green, uh, where there's no green, then there's uh, less upwelling in this area or maybe no upwelling in the area. But somewhere where there are green patches, such as the coast, then we can Im infer uh, that upwelling occurs in this area. And as you can see in other maps or images of the world, other parts of the world, you see that the coastal regions are where the, the green is concentrated or the phytoplankton is concentrated because upwelling would normally would occur in these areas. Now we look at the sea surface temperature and the sea surface temperature across the globe depends on two factors, the radiative factors and the dynamical factors. Now we've looked at radiative factors where in the equator there's more sun and so it receives a, a high amounts of energy from the sun in this region compared to the relative amounts of energy from the sun in the north and the south pole. And this temperature difference creates a strong temperature gradient between the poles and the equator. And the sea surface temperature also depends on the dynamical factors or the factors that's caused by season or the tilting of the earth on its axis and also the surface winds as discussed in the relationship between the wind circulation and also the ocean circulation before. So you just uh, take a key study of the globe, we take a look at the Pacific Ocean where there are four main regions that shows cold, relatively cold temperatures and relatively warm temperatures. So here we see cold temperatures in these areas and warm temperatures here and these are caused by wind pattern that brings cold air from the top to the south, which can be seen uh, in the cold region here, and it, 
and also wind patterns that move from the south into the north as shown here. Now these winds absorb more energy from the water which causes the water to be cooler and as it moves, uh, as the wind moves through in, an, in a cyclonic anti-cyclonic pattern, it would be warm and it would absorb less energy from the ocean which causes the ocean in the western side of the Pacific to be warmer and this can also be seen for the regions south of the equator here. But this has an opposite effect in the subpolar regions where it has, the winds has become cooler and the temperature here will be relatively cooler uh, because of the wind absorbing the heat from the ocean. But as it moves to the eastern side of the area, it, uh, it gains heat and makes this region relatively warmer compared to this region. Uh, this shows the tight relationship between sea surface temperature and also general patterns of the wind or the dynamical factors that has an effect on the sea surface temperature at a global scale.